Amen. Let's all stand to our feet and we'd ask Brother Peter if he'd invite the presence of the Lord to be with us this morning. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can hear the sound of angels' wings. I see glory in each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. <coughs> Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. I can hear the sound of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. One more time, very worshipful now. <coughs> Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and his grace I can feel the sound of angels wings I see glory on each face <coughs> surely the presence of the Lord is in this place Amen. And number 204, within the veil, because that's where we're headed. We're speaking on the unveiling of God, and we've got to go in. Within the veil, I now have come. Into thy holy place I looked upon thy face I see such beauty here None other <coughs> can compare I worship Thee, my Lord, within the veil, within the veil, I now have come. 
into thy holy place. I look upon thy face. I see such beauty here. None other can compare. I worship Thee, my Lord, within the veil. <coughs> Amen. At this time, we'll change the order of service to uh, prayer. And uh, we want to pray, continue to pray for Brother David Lowe from Scotland for continued healing and uh, the tumor... Uh, Lord, just take that from his spine. Uh, Brother Bill Caldwell, uh, he had broken some ribs. He's now home from the hospital, and the Lord is healing him quickly. But let's just continue to pray for him, and not only that, but for his prostate condition. Um, and then uh, the Davis family, we want to continue to pray for them, that the Lord would turn, turn them around. And Brother, uh, Brother Samuel, and uh, Brother Samuel Taggart's son, Joshua, uh, continued healing of his leg. He is walking, he's walking again, so we want to thank the Lord for that. You know, the Lord is answering a lot of prayers around the world, and, and uh, I'm just really thankful for that. Um, and then for missions, uh, Brother Ben Caleb uh, going to India in July. Uh, he's taking my place, so I don't have to go. And uh, not that I don't want to go, but well, I'll be honest, I don't want to go, but... Um, but it's not that, because if the Lord told me to go, I'd go. Uh, they do need help there, and so uh, Brother Ben will be uh, going in my place. And uh, you all know Brother Ben, he's a fine preacher. And he'll be going to Brother Asterthwathen and Brother Mariupon. They're both two different locations. And uh, so the, it'll be a hardship, but uh, they're more used to it in Uganda, that you know way of life, than, than we are. Um, and again, I, I'm not saying that I'm copping out but uh, I just I just feel like my place is here and uh, you know there's there's a lot of people hooking up around the world uh, we have about 18 uh, or sometimes we have 17 and about 8 so uh, we got about 25 people uh, that are hooking up and then we have those those are IP addresses then I don't know how many people uh, are, are, are actually on I know in Australia there's probably close to 8 or 10 uh, alone and then uh, over in England there's at least uh, Every week there's at least four there, plus another two or three that come in. So um, uh, we have South Africa, we have, uh, there's three churches actually over in um, in um, Burka Faso, um, and that's the efforts of Brother Jacob. He's uh, He's been teaching the doctrine over there. So we want to thank Brother Jacob, and uh, you just pray for him that the Lord would you know he's got a degree. He's got a in in uh, geological engineering, and he's you know really smart kid. But um, he also has about seventy people in the church, and they almost have services every day. So I don't know how you could work a job and have services every day. But uh, just pray that the Lord would uh, just you know support him through the ministry, and uh, so so that the, you know he wouldn't have to work uh, a, a, a menial job. He'd be able to focus his attention on. Uh, on the people of God. Um, meetings in Norway in June and uh, possibly, I'm still praying about uh, Uganda in in late June, early July. Um, I'm just kind of feeling led away from that at this point. You know, I've been to many of these places, uh, as many as, well, been to Uganda three times already, <coughs> been to uh, Congo six, seven times. I don't feel any leading to go back. <coughs> Uh, there's places I've been to many times, like Poland. I just don't have a leading to go back. And um, plus, there's just too much fussing uh, in some of these countries. Uh, the brothers fussing with the brothers, and I just I don't want to get involved in any of the local disputes or any of the the national disputes that they have. You know, I, I've got enough on my plate. Uh, just being focused on getting myself ready and getting this little group and those who hook up with this. So. Um, I'm not that I'm scaling back, but in a way I am. I'm just feeling not led to do some of the things that we did before. I'm, in fact, uh, just the frustration with the website. I'm going to cut it back to one website, 
uh, are two websites, the, uh, the ones that I do myself. Uh, the ones that, are, that were done in PHP, there are just too much problems with them and just keeping them up and I'm doing double duty every time I put a sermon up I got to put it on two different locations and uh, and then on, on that one I've got to reformat everything so you know to make paragraphs I mean if I just put it in there it jumps it all together then I've got to and if I don't do anything it's just one paragraph and the only reason why I'm doing that website is that you can search the sermons but really people have the search engines that search Brother Brown and, and uh, you know like uh, Jesus said uh, you know, they've got Moses and the prophets. Uh, you know, they've got Brother Ram. They've got, they've got, thus saith the Lord. They don't need to search my sermons. They don't need to search Brother Vale's sermons, I don't think. Uh, sure, it's nice to know some things that, you know, that he said. But honestly, if we're not saying what the prophets said, then you don't need to hear it anyway. And I don't say that, but you don't need to hear Brother Vale or don't need to hear me. I'm just, I'm not saying that. But I'm just saying that you have the prophet's message out there. That's what we take. And we take it back to the scripture. So <clears throat> that's the only reason why I've kept that that dot com website um, the other one for those that are watching overseas if you want to get the 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 PDFs in color and uh, and the HTML's in color then uh, it's, it's actually you just type in message com and you put a forward slash then you put old old and then underscore that's the that's a little line that looks like uh, you're underlining but it's an underscore and then um, uh, htm dot com so it's just old underscore htm.com. It's going to give you the old index. And uh, I tried actually getting rid of the PHP last night, but my, my thing is still in migration. I can't upload any sermons to the .com. I can't to the underscore, underscore dot old. No, I, actually, I can't do that either. Right now, I'm just locked out. I mean, I can, I can view my pages that I have there, but I'm locked out. And uh, you can now on the, on the dot underscore old dot com or dot html you can uh, you can actually still read my sermons because the whatever happened on that website um, it didn't mess up the the pdfs so but it did everything the pdfs and everything on the other because it's all script and uh, the script has a bunch of skibbly goop you know that uh, uh, I have no clue what it's talking about so anyway just keep and just keep the website in prayer I you know, if I can get down to the two, it'd be manageable. And uh, and like I said, uh, you know, if you want a search engine, we've got the, we still have the search engine on disk. We can give you, it has all of Brother Branham's. It's, it still has about um, 600 Brother Vales and about uh, maybe 13 or 1400 of mine. Just doesn't have about the last uh, three, four years. Uh, which. I'm, I've been preaching the same thing for 20 some years now, so it's just a matter of how different doing it. You know, it, it, the Lord is opening up a little bit more on, on different things. So, all right. So, um, Brother Steve, would you take all these prayer requests before the Lord? <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Number 158, I exalt thee. For thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Far above all oh God, <clears throat> for Thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all God. I exalt thee, <coughs> I exalt thee, I exalt thee. Oh, Lord, I exalt thee. 
exalted. We'd have the, uh, see our deacons are gone, Brother Steve, and Brother Steve, if you would come forward and take up the tithes and offerings this morning. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Amen. When I look into your holiness, <clears throat> we're singing to him. When I look into your holiness, when I gaze into your loveliness, when all things that surround become shadows, in the light of you <clears throat> when I found the joy of reaching your heart when my will becomes enthroned in your love when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you I worship you <coughs> I worship you the reason I live is to worship you I worship you, <coughs> Lord, I worship you, Ooh. the reason I live is to worship you. When I look into your holiness, when I gaze into your loveliness, when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you, <coughs> When I found the joy of reaching your heart, when my will becomes enthroned in your love, when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you, I worship you. I worship you, Ooh, the reason I live is to worship you. is to worship you. Amen. If we all stand to our feet and we'll sing the angel of the Lord's favorite song, Only Believe. <coughs> Only Believe Only Believe All things are possible only believe only believe only believe all things
things are possible Only believe Jesus, you're here Jesus, you're here All things are possible now that you're here, Jesus, you're here, <clears throat> Jesus, you're here, all things are possible now that you're here. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for your, for your presence among us. You didn't have to come, Lord. You didn't have to save us. You didn't have to send your son 2,000 years ago and to send him again pretty soon, Lord. But you could have just left it all between you and your son, and I'm sure that you'd enjoyed his fellowship. But, Father, we, we know that you wanted to have fellowship with your children. And, Father, we want to have fellowship with you. And so, Lord, we just ask you to help us to step aside from who we are as human beings and enter into who we are as sons and daughters of God, being conformed to the image of your firstborn son who was conformed to your image. Father, we love you. We appreciate you, Lord, and everything that you do for us. Sometimes it doesn't look like we appreciate you as much as we do, but... Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to be focused. The hour which we live is just very deathly, very sick, very confusing. It's just an hour of hatred and just, just debauchery and just pollution of the mind, pollution of the soul and everywhere we look, which results in pollution of the land and water and air and sea. But Father, we know that we have a promise in this hour. And we should be like you, and we will see you as you are. Help us, Lord, to get ready for the day and the hour of the appearing ending, ending with the voice, ending with the trump, and then the destruction shall come. Lord, we commit all of these things into thy hands. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> This morning we're going to continue with our study of Brother Bram's sermon, The Unveiling of God, preached June 14th, 64, in Jeffersonville, Indiana, at the Branham Tabernacle, where he felt free to cover doctrine. In sermon number one, last Sunday, we spoke concerning how that the unveiling is what brings forth the revealing. In other words, if there wasn't an unveiling, there wouldn't have been a revealing. Um, now, many people think of revelation as something that is a mental function, but it's not. Revelation, according to the dictionary, is a manifestation of divine truth, and you can't take the word manifestation out of there or you wouldn't have revelation. Because revelation is unveiling. It's something that's being done. It's an opening up. It's a, it's a, it's a revealing. Therefore, if there is no manifesting, which comes from an unveiling, then there would be no revelation. Now, Wednesday night, we, we then spoke of the parallelism of Scripture and showed how that revelation is a manifestation of divine truth, and it will either bring a blessing or a curse, depending on whether you hearken to it or not. And we showed how there is a, uh, a not only a parallelism of Scripture, but there's a parallel universe. What we are here is, what, is a reflection of what we are somewhere else. Now this morning, we will begin to look into the Scriptures that Brother Brown laid out for his text for a sermon, The Unveiling of God. And to do so, we're going to go to paragraph number 9 and, 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 uh, of his sermon, The Unveiling of God, and pick up reading there. Uh, the, from the unveiling of God for the rest of now in and I want to read from Philippians the second chapter 1 through 8 and 2nd Corinthians 3 beginning at the 6th and reading into the 4th of 2nd Corinthians now we're not going to get that far today we're only going to cover Philippians the second chapter 1 through 8 all right he said I'll, I'll read first before reading let's pray Lord Jesus the, thy word is truth and in this troublesome hour that we're living, nation against nation, pestilence, earthquakes in many places, men's hearts failing for fear, we see the handwriting on the wall. Now, it's interesting because, remember, Trump is a peace and safety president. He's now doing something with North Korea that's going to 
you know, it should give him the Nobel Peace Prize, but they only give it to people that start wars. They don't give it to people that cause peace. He used, and let's face it, he's going to meet in March, but he's already met. When he went to uh, China, remember, and, and he went to the, uh, the great city where they have all those soldiers and stuff, he met with the president of North Korea then. And you see after then, they sent their people to the Olympics. They started cooperating. They started being more social. They quit all this you know, fuss with the bombs and everything else. So they've already had a meeting. Now they're going to have a public meeting. All right? When you see peace, peace, you know sudden destruction coming. On the other hand, we have Russia, who is prophesied by a vindicated prophet. God, actually, he didn't do it. God did it. God showed him the visions, showed this nation be decimated with, with fire. Russia, Mr. Putin, and it seems like he was ordained for the job to clean up this country because this country, look, Trump is trying to do everything he can to drain the swamp, but there are so many swamp critters, it's just unfathomable. I don't think he can do it. But I think God can. And God's going to do it the right way. And that's with fire. And it's going to happen. And I don't want to see it happen. I pray every day for my family. Uh, not, 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 well, I pray for my fa local, you know, family, my own children, my, my grandchildren. But I also pray for my brothers and sisters, those that aren't saved yet. I pray they get saved. I pray, you know, John, you pray, keep praying for yours. You keep praying for your mother. Just keep praying that the Lord will do something. Because, look, this is a late hour. It's very late. And... <clears throat> In this troublesome hour that we're living, nation against nation, pestilence, earthquakes in many places, men's hearts failing for fear, we see the handwritings on the wall. Now that is in the natural realm, that all the world should see this. But now there's a spiritual realm also, and we see the, the great happenings, and we want to speak of them today. Bless thy word to our heart. We know that there is no man in heaven or in earth that is worthy to take the book to loose the seals or to look upon it. But there was one appeared, a slain lamb bloody, that came and took the book and was worthy and able to open it. O Lamb of God, open thy word to our hearts today for comfort. We are your servants. Forgive our sins, Lord. And anything that would keep thy word from going forth with great power and influence on, uh, today on our lives, take it away, Lord. Any hindrance that we might have full access to all the blessings promised to us through thy word, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Notice the world, all their things going on, they're so distracted by all that, they fail to recognize when God sent a prophet. They have a great big shindig and a great to-do for Billy Graham, who was, uh, they, they call him this nation's pastor or this nation's preacher, when actually this nation's preacher was a vindicated prophet, and they turned him down. He was a preacher, he was the, he was the pastor of Sodom. William Branham was the preacher, the pastor of the Bride of Jesus Christ. We recognize the unveiling of God. They do not. They haven't seen it. They never will see it. Now, until the judgment starts. Until the judgment starts. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. If there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, remember, his Spirit will bear witness with your Spirit, that's fellowship. If any bowels of mercies, fulfilling my joy that you be like-minded. Like-minded. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. You see, if you don't consider the other better than yourself, then you always walk around with your nose up in the air, like we've got it, they don't. I'm better than them because I got it and they don't got it. I'm going in and they're not because I'm special and all that kind of tummy rot. But when you begin to look with eyes of loneliness and humility and you say, you know what, they're my brother. I don't want to see anybody perish. I don't want to see anybody go to the lake of fire. I don't want to see anybody, you know, uh, with the fear of the, of the judgments and the fear of the bombs coming and, and, the, and the raping and the pillaging and all that's going to go on. I don't want to see that.
Let each esteem the other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things. You see, that's the problem we have. We're so focused on self. But every man also on the things of others. Yeah, we should be focused on the things of others. What can I do? What can I pray for Brother Nick today? He's going through a trial. What can I do to pray for him? What can I do to help him through this trial? What can I do for his children? That they can be in church. That they can learn how to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. What can I do for them? What can I do for Brother Steve? You know, what can I do? He's getting older. And uh, he's got some health issues. What can I do for Brother Bill Caldwell? You know, 80, he's in his 80s and you know, he's, he's, he's struggling with age. At one time he was a strapping football player. Now he's, he's just an old man and I'm, a, I'm, I'm kind of following in, in that, those footsteps. What can we do for one another to make life's burdens a little bit easier? Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. And let this mind be in you. This same mind that was in Christ Jesus. He didn't look to, oh, I don't want to get nails through my hands, my feet. I, I don't want to take the lashes. I don't want to take the beating. I don't want to be lifted up and, and hung in such a place. And, oh, I have to breathe. I have to struggle for every breath I get. I don't want to go through. But Lord, there are your brothers, my brothers and sisters out there. They need healing. They need salvation. They need restoration. They need, they need inheritance. And it's, it's encumbered upon me to do so for them. I was in his mind, as a, as a song was saying, when Calvary's hill he climbed. I was in his mind when he went through all those things. You were in his mind. <clears throat> Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, being in a theophonic body, being in a body that never knew pain or sorrow, never knew hunger or thirst, never knew grief or sorrow, and thought it not robbery to be equal with God, because as God was, so is he. But made himself of no reputation. Didn't even consider about a reputation. And took upon him the form of a servant. And was made in the likeness of of men and being found in fashion as a man what's the first thing he did he humbled himself and he became obedient unto death even the death of the cross now never forget as we study this sermon of brother Brams that the main theme throughout this sermon is the unveiling of God Yet Brother Bram does not begin with the scripture for his text that concerns God himself, the eternal spirit, the great fountain of wisdom, but rather he chooses a scripture for his text that focuses our thoughts on the vessel that God chose to manifest himself through. That of his beloved firstborn son, Jesus, the son of God. The unlikely veil that revealed the mighty God. And no other scripture expresses this as directly as Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, we will spend the necessary time in viewing Philippians 2. And therefore, there is something to be said about this great, uh, the scripture that speaks of the Son of God, the vessel of God's choosing that God himself chose to use in order to unveil himself to mankind. And more important than that, is the very words that Paul used to describe the vessel that God used to unveil himself to mankind. <clears throat> and they were big, flirtatious, and flattering words. On the other hand, on contrary to that, because God, being who he is, essentially and intrinsically, and you would think that he would have used a vessel that was the smartest, the strongest, the wisest, the best-looking vessel that, we, that he could have chosen to unveil himself. But he chose to use a vessel just the opposite of all those attributes named. In Isaiah 53, we read, He is despised 
and rejected of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted. What does the word acquainted mean, Steve? Used to it. You're used to it. Acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Isaiah 53 and 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. Now there are two words specifically that we read here that really, really stand out. Number one, the Isaiah prophecy tells us of the Son of God that he was despised and he was rejected of men. And I'd like to break down this statement into two points. Number one, it tells us he was despised. Now this word despised, according to the Greek word, the Greek concordance, it means to be disesteemed. Disesteemed. Now when we esteem something, we hold them in a high value. When we disesteem it, that's like the modern term, they diss them. They're not important, of no value. They regarded him with contempt, with distaste, with disgust, and with disdain. They scorned him and they loathed him. What did he do to deserve it? He came to save them. He came to heal them. He came to love them and to show them how to love. Now the second thing they did in a follow-up for their disgust and disdain is that they rejected him. They dissed him entirely. Now you have to think in terms of the people who longed for Messiah to come. These were a people who had themselves been rejected by the world and considered as the offscouring of the earth. These were a people who at the time of the Messiah coming, they were put down by Rome and were virtually prisoners in their own country, having lost all freedom of expression to worship God after the dictates of their own hearts. So they were the lowest of the low, and he came to them expressing the condition they were in. They were looking for someone grand and strong and big and powerful to lift them out of their despair. And he came to take them down deeper. He, brought, he came to help them to die to themselves. But they didn't want to do that. But he showed us how to do that. Because the only way up, brother, sister, is down. He that exalts himself will be abased, but he that abases himself shall be exalted. Now think of that. He could have come as the king of kings, because that's who he is. He could have come with legions of angels decked out in brilliant white with swords drawn, set before him, forming an arch before him everywhere he went, as he walked among men. You know like they do with the military weddings? The, uh, uh, I've been to several where, the, where the, all, the, all the military, all the uh, officers will stand there with their swords and when the bride and groom come down the aisle, they have their swords or when they go out the door, they have their swords in an arch. And there'll be at least maybe a half a dozen to a dozen on each side and the bride and groom will walk through the arch and Jesus could have come with the angels with their swords drawn and everywhere he walked there would always be an arch before him showing how much they esteemed him, showing how much they appreciated him. But there wasn't. He washed the feet. He was a foot wash flunky. And he could have come all decked out in the finest of clothes and the finest golden crown with the best jewels money could buy because he had the power to just speak them into existence and it could have come with the best choirs and the best orchestras accompanying him everywhere he went but he didn't come that way there wasn't orchestras in his church there wasn't choirs in his church because he came to those of low estate he came to the lowest of the low and he was born in a manger surrounded by the dumbest of animals, smelly animals, and then he presented his vessel that he chose to unveil himself through. God presented that vessel to shepherds. 
shepherds. You know the guys with PhDs? No. Uh -uh. Shepherds whose job qualifications are the lowest of all occupations. All they have to do is watch over some sheep. Put up with the smell. Put up with the bleeding. Bleating. Just dumb sheep. That's all they had to tend to. He did not come to the priesthood, those men who were decked out in the finest of linens, nor to the rich who also were decked out with their Rolex watches and expensive attire. Uh-uh. No. He came to shepherds, the lowest of the common people. In fact, below being common. And that is who he revealed himself in this vessel to first. Can you imagine that? First. I know when I go overseas, they tell me the ministers that come over from the U.S. And, and from Europe and different places. They will only have maybe this pastor and two other rich people, you know, that they'll hang around with the whole time they're there. They won't see the people in the churches. They won't go out and answer questions for the people, the common people. They sit aloft in their hotel room and they'll meet with the rich guy and maybe uh, somebody that can support their ministry a little more even though they are got a million dollars a year coming in. But they won't go to the person in the pew. They wouldn't dare preach or, or lay their hands upon some of those poor sick people that have tuberculosis and very, uh, very contagious diseases. They wouldn't get near. Listen, I've been there. I've had them tell me that you're the only guy that's done this. You're the only guy that will make himself available to whoever. Don't ask me why I do it. It's in my heart. God is children. It doesn't matter what color of their skin. It doesn't matter what they smell like. It doesn't matter what they look like. He has children. Those are his children. So let's go back to Read again from Isaiah 53 and verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Now throughout scripture when it, is re it refers to the arm of God, it is often is referring to the very strength of God in manifestation. Notice that in this verse in Isaiah, he's making reference to the power of God being revealed in a certain way. The arm of the Lord. In Isaiah 53 and 1, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Well, in 52 and 10, he says, The, the Lord hath made bare his, his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. That arm is our salvation. That arm is our strength. That arm is our deliverance. And then God bears it forth, that arm in a vessel born over a manure pile in a stinking stable amidst sheep, oxen, goats. He bears forth that arm first. The angel goes and brings, the angel of the Lord, goes and brings the shepherds. Those guys who are used to putting up with the sheep and their stink and all the stuff that goes with it, the bleeding, the fussing. And he doesn't reveal that arm to the kings, to the priests. No. God is veiled to them still. Now notice the words, the Lord hath made bare his holy arm, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. The arm of God throughout the Bible symbolizes the power of God, and the strength of God. The reference to strength in the arm was first used by Jacob on his deathbed when he prophesied concerning his son Joseph, whom he loved so much. <laughs> in Genesis 49, 24, he said, but his bow abode in, the, in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. The source of all true strength, of course, is almighty God. And there are at least 40 references to the arm of the Lord as it represents his strength throughout the Old Testament. 
But in Isaiah 53, we see that this reference to the arm of the Lord is referring to none other than Jesus Christ himself. But notice how this great strength of God, which is the mighty God revealed, is met by the world. This same scripture tells us he was despised and rejected. Nevertheless, some of the lowly ones did believe. For listen to his own mother's prophecy after receiving the promise to become the mother of Messiah. Listen carefully to what she said as we read in the book of Luke, beginning at 46. You know, the Catholic Church wants to make Mary some all wisdom, all knowledgeable, uh, you know, a mediatrix where you can go to her in prayer. Listen, Mary doesn't do that. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus. But listen to what her attitude was about herself. And Mary said, my soul, Luke 1, 46, my soul doth magnify the Lord. And to magnify anything is to enlarge in it. So she is saying, my soul doth enlarge the Lord. My, my soul doth make the Lord very large in my own sight. Verse 47. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. <clears throat> For he hath regarded the low estate. He hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. Behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me the lowest of the low. Great things and holy is his name. <clears throat> and his mercy is on them that fear, fear him from generation to generation. He has skewed, he, excuse me, he has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighties from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent them away empty. Why? Blessed are the poor for they shall inherit the kingdom. Notice her awareness though. Now people say, well, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. They say, poor in spirit? Listen, poor in spirit means this. That without God, I'm nothing. That's it. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, who know and are very humble in their spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. The way up is down. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he hath sent away empty. Notice, <clears throat> notice her awareness though of how God came to the lowest of the low to reveal himself and to show forth the might of his arm. He did not have a high she did not have a high opinion of herself. As the Apostle Paul said in Romans 12, 12 and 3, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. What is the measure of faith? It's the same measure that Jesus had. There's only one the measure. And that's to have the same faith and to live by the same faith that Jesus did. And that was he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Father, my meat is to do the will of you. Her confession of faith is the first use of the word arm in reference to the power and might of God in the New Testament. And again, refers to the saving arm of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that the arm of God is not only mighty to save, but it also shows security in holding them that are his as we see in Isaiah 40 and verse 10. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them into his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with him. Notice these descriptive attributes and characteristics of God that are displayed in the poetic use of the arm of God. Number one, his arm shall rule for him. Number two, he shall gather the lambs with his arm. And number three, he shall carry them. You have to, carry, you have, to have arms to carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those 
that are with you. So we see as Paul spoke in Brother Bram's opening text, where he describes the Son of God coming in such a manner to unveil the mighty God, and yet in such a humble way that only the humble might see it and might receive this unveiling which brings forth this revealing. Now let's continue to read from Isaiah 53 and the attributes and characteristics of this vessel that God chose to reveal himself as he unveils himself through that vessel known as Jesus. From Isaiah 53 and 2, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, not a big strapping oak tree, a little sprout coming out of the ground. The Hebrew word yaoneg, it means a little sucker. Anybody know what a sucker is? It's a twig that's growing off of a dead stump or a dead tree. We see those growing up and we say get the weed eater out and just hack them. And that's what they thought of Jesus. A tender plant, a sprouting. Notice the picture by words that we're receiving from God's very description of the Son of God. You know, when we call a person a sucker, that's a derogatory word which is meant to put as a put down. And yet his attitude and expression was, I sure am. That's what I am. And Isaiah continues, and as a root out of dry ground. Not a root out of very rich soil. Not a root out of moist ground, but a root out of dry ground. Stringy. Shriveled. Weak. Sickly. And Isaiah continued, he hath no form, nor comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He wasn't a Hollywood star. He wasn't like Saul, who stood head, over, head, head and shoulders over the people. There's no beauty that we should desire him. The NIV puts it this way, he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. I, this is, now listen, we're looking at the veil of God. And how God used that veil to unveil himself. From the voice, out of emptiness he came. Like a tender shoot from hard rock ground. He didn't look like anything or anyone of consequence. He had no physical beauty to attract our attention. From Isaiah 53 and 2, <clears throat> the servants from the message. Uh, the servant grew up before God, a scrawny seedling, a scrubby plant in a parched field. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing to cause us to take a second look. And finally, let's look at Isaiah 53 and 2 from the Amplified Bible. For he, the servant of God, grew up before him like a tender shoot plant and like a root out of dry ground. He was no stately form or majestic splendor that we would look at him, nor handsome appearance that we would be attracted to him. There was nothing attractive about him. And yet that was the veil of God. That was the expression of God. That was a declaration of God. Notice Brother Bram in beginning this sermon on the unveiling of God, which he preaches a few weeks later and calls the mighty God unveiled. Yet Brother Bram still uses the same scriptures to show how that the mighty God unveiled and thus revealed himself to mankind using this humble vessel who when he came was not even esteemed by man. Not even esteemed. They looked for God to come and deliver them as Messiah. And when God came veiled, they looked at the veil and said, uh-uh. We don't accept that. <clears throat> How many of you have ever accepted God's answer to your prayer when it wasn't what you wanted? I ain't going to accept that. Well, then you're not accepting God because that's his answer. I think it's time that we, we just reapproach our way of approach. We reevaluate or evaluate our whole approach to life. So as we read from Isaiah 53 and 3, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. 
Surely he hath borne our griefs. He bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Notice Paul says, though he came bearing the same infirmities that consume all of us, though we bore our own griefs and carried our own sorrows, yet we did not even esteem him. He carried them for us, and that caused him to be the man of sorrows. And we never realized that he was that way because he was doing it for you and for me. That would be like the man who his wife pulled him out of a burning building, covered him with a, a sheet, pulled him out of the burning building, and she got all scarred up and burnt and had just repulsive-looking uh, surgery. And because she's not beautiful anymore, he divorces her. She was that way because of him. And in return, what does she get? Not thanks, not more love, but repulsion. And that's our Jesus. He came as we really are, and we didn't even appreciate it, nor even recognize what he did for us. Paul speaks of the Son of God in Philippians 2, verse 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but willingly for your sake and mine, made himself of no reputation. He emptied himself out. He took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Now back to Isaiah 53 and 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. With his stripes, we benefit. With his bruising, we benefit. With the nails in his hands, we benefit. With the crown of thorns upon his head, we benefited. He didn't. We do. He couldn't use his gift for himself, so he used it. For us. As when Brother Branham lay there all twisted up in the steering wheel of the wreckage of his car. And he asked Billy, the first thing he said, he said, Billy, is your mother okay? And Billy went over and checked her. He said, no, Dad, she's dead. He said, take my hand. He said, take my hairpiece off first. Take my hairpiece off. Because remember, the Bible says you don't pray with your hair covered, your head covered, men. All right. He took his, and he said, put my hand. He had to take his hand from out of the steering wheel. Put my hand on her. And Brother Bram prayed, and she came back to life. And Bill said, oh, God. He said, Daddy, do that for yourself. Let's lay your hands on you. He said, son, I can't. The gift isn't for me. It's for others. Jesus, great victory was at Gethsemane when he said, Father, I would that you take this cup from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. When Jesus died to Jesus, that you and I might live by the same life. And so what does God's word say about us? All we, all, A-W-L, all we like sheep have gone astray. All of us, every one of us. We've all gone astray. We've all lost sight of God's purpose and plan for our lives. We have nothing to boast about. Therefore, as the Apostle Paul taught us in Ephesians 2 and verse 8, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, can't boast about it, it is a gift of God, not of, not of works, lest any man should boast. God don't want a bunch of proud, boasting children. He wants, a, he wants a lot of loving, caring children. 
And what will boasting get you anyway? We find out in the book of Acts 5, 36, for before these days rose up Thutis, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, and he was slain, and all of them too. As many as obeyed him, they were scattered and brought to nothing. That's where your boasting will get you. <clears throat> Again in Romans 3, 23, the Apostle Paul said, all, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, all, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness that we might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what? Of works? Nay, but by the, by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. It's God working in you to will and to do. Therefore, when you find yourself willing, it's because God is willing in you. God is showing you how to will. And then the next thing is, he shows you how to do. As little children coming to the kingdom, totally, totally, 100% dependent to do what daddy does. We see it and we do it. Now, I'm getting back to Isaiah 53. We pick up at verse 6. We have turned everyone, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him. We turn to our own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. We were guilty. He paid the price. One of the ways that men have kept other men in subjection to the rules is that they will punish others when they appear to be someone amongst their ranks who gets out of line. In prisons, this form of co uh, or coercion, coercion is used. If a prisoner breaks a rule, others are punished for the whole. The prisoner steals something, others are punished in their stead. I remember as a child one night, we were all called into the kitchen by my father, who, as a commander of the Navy, had been schooled in the discipline that is necessary to keep a ship in order. And so we all approached our dad in the kitchen that night, and he asked who had been stealing the cookies out of the cookie jar. Rousted from our beds. Stood there before an angry dad. Not one of us spoke up. Not a one. Everyone was afraid. So he said, then all of you will stand in the corner for the next few hours until a th the thief comes forward. You're all going to be punished for the one. I looked at my brothers and sisters, and something in me said, if no one confesses, then everyone will suffer. So I stepped forward that night and said, I'll confess to it. You can put me in the corner, Dad. And he did. I do not know why I, I, I did that. But something in me didn't want to see my brothers and sisters all to be punished for the wrong done by one. And I was not the one that did it. But since no one was confessing, we were all either going to get punished or one would take the punishment. I didn't do it. I knew that, I knew that but neither did I know who did do it. And one of them was guilty, but not all of them were guilty. So I stood in the corner in the dark basement for several hours that night, like a dungeon to me. You know, you have to remember as a child, when the gas furnace turns on, there's a loud noise. And then the expansion of the metal sounds like someone's crawling through the ductwork. And I thought with the fire in the chamber, it was the portal to hell. In fact, it wasn't a gas furnace, it was an oil filter, an uh, oil, oil furnace, and those are just bang, they start off, and then you know, just crinkling and crackling of all that metal in the end. I don't know if you ever saw the film Home Alone, but you know, a little boy down there in the basement, when it, the furnace started up, you know, your imagination plays, you think that's hell, you see the flames of fire, you think that's hell, you think the demons are coming to get you. You're a little kid of maybe seven, eight years old standing there all alone in the basement with the lights off. That's torture. 
Now, it wasn't that my dad was an evil man. He just, he was very disciplined. It's not that I thought, well, going, you know, standing in the corner is a nothing. And, you know, a, what do they call him, a nothing burner. It was, but I didn't realize even that when all that noise started from the furnace, I was just really, really scared. But Jesus was not asked to stand in a corner for a few hours. The Bible tells us, Isaiah 53, 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. The depiction in Mel Gibson's movie of Christ, the Passion of Christ, when they showed hardly any skin on his back, and what skin was there was hanging. And those cat and nine tails that they used had bones in them that struck off the flesh. And they said by accident, when uh, they were filming, one of the men actually, when he, when he went to whip him, there was supposed to be like a, <clears throat> there was supposed to be a, a, a thing behind him that the whip, they're supposed to hit the whip. It was hidden from camera. But his lash went beyond that pole and actually struck and actually pulled skin and, and, and tissue off of his back. And the suffering that, <laughs> that he went through, if you ever read his biography, the suffering that he went through in the making of that movie, struck by lightning twice while hanging on the cross. It actually made a Christian out of him. Bruised for our iniquity. Wounded for our transgressions. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Our iniquity laid upon him. First Peter 4 and 1 tells us, for, for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he, has, for he that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. He that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from unbelief. I'll never forget, I came back from two, year 2000, 18 years ago. Came back from the Philippines with African sleeping sickness. Didn't know what it was at the time. I got angry with God. I said, Lord, why did you do this? I went over there to, to be of service, to do your bidding. And a few hours before I was to leave to come home, I've come down with this terrible sickness. I, I can't, my bones hurt, my, my joints hurt. I've got fever. Why did you do this? And I didn't hear from God for about three weeks. He let me sit there and suffer in my own stew. And I learned a lesson. He's God. He was teaching me to be more like his son. Because when he asks you to do something, he's, you don't be expecting after you've completed that to come with a laurel wreath of victory on a parade. Expect now to suffer for what you did for him. Then you'll be like him. If you take your suffering the way Jesus did. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us, suffered for us, suffered for us, in his flesh. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh ceases from his unbelief. 
Notice those words of the Apostle Paul. When you are willing to suffer for your wrong, you won't do that wrong anymore. And you won't compile it by lying on top of what you did or complicate it. In other words, many times people do a wrong. That's one sin. But then you lie about what you did. And you're, comp you're compiling it. Adding sin upon sin upon sin. You won't do that. You won't do that anymore. When you're willing to suffer for your wrong, you won't do the wrong anymore. And you're not going to lie about it either. Now from a sermon communion, Brother Brown said, Now if God did not spare his own son from the cruel testings, then he will not spare you or I from cruel testings. And Jesus was here confronting the greatest test that he ever had. Gethsemane laid just before him, where that once and final all-sufficient test must come, when the burdens of the entire world laid upon his shoulders, there was no one in heaven on earth could have stood it but him. And to know that all of the sins of past sins and present sins and future sins rested upon this decision, and it was one of the most greatest victories that Christ ever won or proved, his great messiahship, when he said to God, not my will, but thy will be done. <clears throat> that was the greatest victory that he had ever won. All the demons of torment was around him to tempt him and try him. And when he went right, when we get right with God, when our hearts become pure and the Holy Spirit has taken his place in our heart, it's the most glorious thing to have testings. The Bible tells us that our testings and trials are more precious to us than silver and gold of this world. So we are and we should be thankful. From 1 Peter 4, 19, Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. From 1 Peter 4, 16, if, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. In 1 Peter 3, 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, notice the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened, by the Spirit. What was his purpose and motive? That he might bring us to God. First Peter 3 and 17, For it is better if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. First Peter 3 and 14, But if, but and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are you, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. First Peter 2 and 21, For, for even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. First Peter 2 and 20, For what is glory? What, what glory is it? When you have been buffeted for your own faults, you shall take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. First Peter 2 and 19, For this is, a, a thank, this is thankworthy. If a man for conscious toward God endure grief and suffering wrongfully, James 5 and 10, Take my brother the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Hebrews 5 and 8, Though he were a son, yet learned your obedience by the things that he suffered. You see, suffering is for a purpose, brother, sister. It's to mold us and make us and mold us and make us and mold us and make us like the man hammering out the gold until he could see his own image in that gold. Hebrews 2 and 10, For it became him for whom all are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. He was made perfect through suffering. Hebrews 2 and 9, But we see Jesus, <clears throat> who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. In 2 Timothy 1, uh, 3 and 12, Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 2 and 12. If we suffer, we shall reign with him. Don't ever forget that. But if we deny him, that's deny the suffering, he also will deny us. Philippians 129. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. To believe and also to suffer. 1 Corinthians 12 and 26. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. 1 Corinthians 6 and 7. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, 
because you go to the law with one another. Why do you not rather take the wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? 1 Corinthians 4 and 12, and labor, working with our hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer. You see, when the government tried to defraud you, and you finally, you know, all the people telling you, yeah, fight back, fight back, fight back, and the Holy Spirit said, don't, let them have it. When you suffered yourself to be defrauded, what did he do? He gave back to you, and he built your character. You got a double portion there, brother. For Romans 8, 18, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Oh, Lord. Romans 8, 17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be, if so be, that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Acts 5, 41, And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Luke 24, 26, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? He had. Luke 17, 25, But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. You've got to suffer, brother, sister. If you're not suffering for your belief, then you're, you're kind of compromising with the world. You're not taking a stand. But remember, you must suffer and be rejected of this generation before you enter your glory. Luke 9.22 saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised on the third day. Now, in closing, let's go back to Isaiah 53 and read from verse 7. And he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? <clears throat> for he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, and he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. And by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Now, Brother Bram said from the message, influence. That ought to put the Pentecostal church, instead of trying to criticize it, it ought to be in action everywhere with humility and love, trying to show it to the lost and dying people. We should respect it. We should love him and humble ourselves, make ourselves reverent, and be in action like these seraphims was, with reverent and hu reverence and humility, vindicated clarity, promised to us in the last days, and here it is, we see it. Jesus said so. Said it would happen. Here it is. <clears throat> Just before it'll, it'll, be, it'll be burned up, that sign of his coming proves that the coming is right at hand. It could come at any time. I don't see nothing to hinder the rapture of the church right now. Well, in the market, well, the mark of the beast is on the other side. Now remember, see, the apostasy comes in then after the church. Now wait, I, I, I might have said something. something. Uh, that's my way of seeing it. See, and watch. Again, from Jesus, the same, he said, But this is the Lord Jesus Christ in the form of the Holy Spirit, moving among his people, doing the same thing that he did when he's here on earth, identifying himself with his bride, not the church. There's a difference between the church and the bride. Not preaching doctrine, because I don't do that, but uh, to my humble belief, the bride goes through, the, the church goes through the tribulation, the sixth seal to purify, that's right. But the bride don't. She goes in the rapture before that. It's time for the bride to be called out, so now I believe it's the calling out time. I sent some of you brothers a quote the other day. Brother Ram said, all these things with the stars falling and everything else. He said, that's going to happen before the coming. That's going to happen before we're gone. You're going to see it. Then people are going to scramble. <clears throat> Listen, when I was over in the Philippines, I was on my way over when 9-11 took place. Brother Joe White took the service for me. And some of the people that had left church 
for about two weeks after 9-11. They all came back. What are people going to do when the sky is falling, the stars are falling, the sun doesn't give its light, the moon turns to blood, all these things? You see the church is packed then, and it won't do them any good. It won't do them one, one lick of good. Because the Holy Spirit is going around marking those who sigh and cry right now for the abominations done in the city, for the abominations done in the churches, for the abominations done in the nation, for the abominations that are done in the deep state, for the abominations done in your city, in your county, in, in your state, for the abominations that you see everywhere you look. And when you sigh and cry, he's marking you. From question and answer on the seal, said, "Would the bride of Christ have? Would the bride of Christ have a ministry before the rapture? Sure. That's what's going on right now. See, the bride of Christ. Certainly, it is. It is the message of the hour. See, the bride of Christ. Sure, she consists of apostles and prophets and teachers and evangelists and pastors. Is that right? That's the bride of Christ. Sure." She's got a ministry, great ministry. It's the ministry of the hour. But it'll be so humble. So humble. That not even one hundredth of one percent of one percent of the world even knows about it. From the second seal, and aren't you happy to be living in this day? That see, not only that, friends, but always remember now, last Sunday morning, where the whole thing was based on simplicity. See, simple and humble happens in such a way that people just go right on by and don't even know it happened. And remember, we're looking for the coming of the Lord any time. And I made the statement uh, that now perhaps the rapture would be the same way, but it'll be gone and over, and no one will know nothing about it and just come like see and usually and just go on back to the Bible and look how it happens like that see even as great a thing as the Lord Jesus coming nobody knew about it a handful 12 and one of them was a the devil six were looking for it and they saw it six 12 followed him the 70 Ministerial Association left him. Twelve that followed him, one was a devil. And the other twelve, they ran away when he was being crucified. When, actually, when they ran away in the garden before he was even beaten and things. Nobody knew about it. They thought, that crank? Simon, well, the church said, just a fanatic. He's really crazy. Said, he's a madman. We know thou art mad. Mad. It means crazy. We know you got a devil and it's, and it's run you crazy. And you try to teach us when, you're, when you were born out, uh, out there illegitimately. Why? You were born in a fornication, tried to teach men like us, the priests and so forth, the temple. Why? That, what an insult to them. And yet that was God unveiling himself through a vessel. The mighty God unveiled. God hiding in simplicity. From Hebrews chapter 3, he says, But we notice the lineage then of Seth, humble men and real men of God, not knowing too much of the things of the world, caring nothing for the things of the world, but had laid aside every weight and had believed God and become prophets and great men in the kingdom, while the others, the other religious world, they laughed at them, made fun of them. But the hour come when the floods and judgment came. So was it in the coming of Jesus Christ, how they laughed and made fun of him while they, they had their own religion and their own churches. But they made fun of the morning star and they laughed at him. But yet they entered into judgment and when they, they flee into, into Jerusalem, where they eat their own children from starvation and their, their blood run in the uh, street gates when they burnt the city and the temple and their souls went into hell. Lord, here we are again on the third. This is the lifetime. Three is the number of life, and here we are ready for the rapture. The church moving on, the great scientific world. <clears throat> the church is today setting full of skeptic believers, tens of thousands with their names on the book. Yes, millions, 
and would laugh at the gospel and say that they're uneducated and, and, and they don't know. And maybe that's so, Lord. But what we lack in education, you make up in grace by sending your angel of light, by manifesting his power, confirming the words to those who are poor and illiterate as we. But we love you for this because it's the grace of God that has did this. And we know that, that we were born and, and, and we're not lovely at all. We're, we're very unlovely. But thou through grace reached down thy merciful hand and had opened our eyes as Jesus prayed for us, as Elijah did for Gehazi, as he looked to see around him. And today, remember, as Jesus prayed for us, and Father, the glory that you gave me, the doxa, the opinions, the values, and judgment you gave me that I could be one with you, I pray that you give them, that they will be one as we are one. As he looked to see around them, and today our eyes are open and we see the things of God and we know that we're moving at the end time when the Gentile people's days are, are about finished and he'll take a people for his name. Let us be included there, Lord, humbly we beg. We pray that you'll grant it. And from the sermon witnesses, he says, and I pray, Father, that you'll light every soul anew here tonight and may the glorious power of the resurrection now shine forth in this audience tonight. <clears throat> How that you humbled yourself and come down and humiliated yourself taken upon yourself the form of a sinful man and was made flesh and dwelt among us and they beheld you the only begotten of the father to think how that he loved us in all that he gave his life for us and he humiliated himself that in his humiliation we were brought nigh to God through his poverty we've been made rich and we are thankful for that the things that I do shall you do also even greater for I go to my father oh Lord I pray tonight that you will manifest your power not that you have to but that your word might be fulfilled. For it is witness that you've come, that you did these things, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the prophets. Now, Lord, may the signs of Messiah appear here tonight, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of Jesus Christ, the things that I do shall you do also, for we ask it in his name. Amen. And that, my brothers and sisters, is our eldest brother Jesus. The veil that God unveiled himself through. The veil, the unlikely veil, that God revealed his intrinsicality and his essentiality. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for having come among us in the body of your Son, and in this hour you've come among us and used a man of low birth, a man born in the hills of Kentucky, a man whose father was a bootlegger, a man that the people looked down and said, he's just the son of a drunk. And you use that man because that man was able to see you because he didn't have a high opinion of himself. He wasn't blinded by his own conceit, but he was humble. And every time you came on the scene and you speak to him, he said, Lord, is that you? He was even unsure of his own five senses and when you give him a vision he pinch himself to know whether it's a vision or whether it's a real thing happening right there father may the humility that was expressed in your son your eldest son Jesus and an older son an older brother of ours William Branham that humility oh God May we have it. May we express it. May we live it. May it be our, our, our portion that we might be like him. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, the Lord bless thee and keep thee, and may the Lord make his face shine upon thee. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make 